It's a pleasure being here today. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Kim, I appreciate that. And uh, let's click the button and we get started. The question is, we know silicon is great. Uh, we know germanium is great. Um, what other materials are coming down the pipeline? And is there an opportunity for us to work together and see whether some of these new, new materials <coughs> can play a role in silicon photonics or in photonics manufacturing? Um, my lab basically focuses on atom joule optoelectronics. We're really trying to push down the energy per bit um, to the atom joule regime. We use these devices in optical information processing, in particular in analog compute engines, and I'll give you an example today. And then we also s um, integrate some of those on like flexible substrates for basic IoT devices and systems. So um, this is uh, basically our group. We demonstrated various uh, devices and structures as basically our um, Presida already mentioned here some sort of like plasmon lasers, tunnel sources, tunable sources, uh, index, uh, unity high index tuning, which is quite interesting. Um, um, with, with IBM together, we looked into how can metals help maybe bring down the temperature dissipation on lasers, on chip, um, soliton switching, more exotic stuff, um, and then some more um, new no novel material integration on ring resonators, and then we, we basically use these devices and systems and try to put them into like novel computer engines on chip and this is work done, I will, um, I will, I will talk about this briefly. Um, so this is basically like the, talk, the topic for today. So how can we basically design systems and devices um, that really are extremely efficient in terms of power? And of course we know all the applications. So the idea basically is that we use some of these novel materials which I will share with you today and then we package them very synergistically with silicon photonics and plasmonics basically, nanophotonic structures um, uh, on the chip. So that's sort of like our slogan here. Um, the design space is like this. So you have a physical new effect that you're trying to harness and you have a certain active material which gives you the functionality that could be gain, this could be switching, this could be modulation or detection. Um, you have an optical mode you need to take care of. There are electrical constraints and possibly you want to consider a cavity and everything of this has to be integrated basically with all the optical and electrical constraints that you have on a chip. Why do we scale in transistors? Why do we scale? Well, it turns out we scale fundamentally because Capacitance goes down, VDD goes down as we have been walking down 5 volt, 3 volt, 2 volt over the time. If these two goes down, energy per bit electrically goes down quite, quite significantly. Also, once we make our channel length uh, uh, shorter, our, I, our, our ion current goes up, that means our delay goes down, that uh, uh, basically goes down, which is great. I can put more on the chip, which means my Mac per Per, uh, my cost per Mac basically goes down, which is great. So, and of course we figured out all the scaling laws. So that's why we did it in a, a, like in field effect transistors. Question, do we win if we go um, in nanophotonics? So is smaller equal better actually in photonics for our community? That's something we asked ourselves recently and the answer is it actually depends uh, as always. The challenge fundamentally is light is big, um, let's say thousand nanometer at visible or near infrared. Electron, the, matter, the wavelength is an order of a nanometer. That's, ten order, uh, that's three orders of magnitude difference, meaning they don't interact strongly. That means my device is hundreds of micrometer typically long, and this is inefficient fundamentally, also energy-wise inefficient. So there's, people look into plasmonics, for instance, or um, metal optics. So here's my thousand nanometer, here's my one nanometer. We try to match these two uh, wavelengths. Um, the whole field of metamaterials lives in this space. They say, I take my dipole moment and I make it big. I'm trying to match this. The whole world of plasmonics says, no, 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 I take this big light and I squeeze it down. It's just uh, basically two approaches to the same idea, the same thing, to address the same problem or challenge. There are two other options we can do this. We all know this, cavities, you can increase Q, or I can squeeze my field down and reduce my mod volume. Both basically applicable solutions to this interaction. And this was a nice paper at FIO along, just like a conference paper, where the gentleman took a, like, like a ring and scaled it down, and you see, of course, Q goes up. So as mold, the, the mold volume scales down, of course, Q goes down as well. Something we kind of know for a long time. So these are the trade-offs. I and mean, of course, we know physically what's going on. There's a radiative bending loss, essentially, that uh, where how I leak, uh, basically like lose my light. That's something we call in the physics world a Purcell factor. Um, so this, this, this Q over V is a magical ratio. If I increase this, I win. But let's look at this a little more carefully. So we essentially look at this from three different cavities. So this is a ring cavity, this is a Fabry Perot linear, and this is a plasmonic particle. And we asked, how do they scale? If I make them small, this is the critical length, the radius, the linear length, and here my basically my, uh, my nanoplasmonic particle, do I win? And the answer is, I win to a certain, like, to a certain like, like, like extent. 
This is basically our performance. This is per cell factor. Up is good. So you see for, these are color coded here naturally. So you see basically there's a certain peak I'm, um, that I can achieve, which is reasonably high actually, for a ring resonator. So a ring actually is pretty good because it scales fairly flat um, with ring radius, but at some point I'm getting bending radius and basically I'm losing Q. But at the same time, as I'm scaling down, my, my radius basically, my mode volume walks down linearly in this, in this log log plot, linearly. So naturally I have a peak. And that peak is pretty interesting actually. This would give me quantum mechanically actually like strong coupling almost, because it's 10 to the three. But that's maybe for another topic. Um, the Fabi per row is decent, but the overall Q is lower. Also, I, as I'm scaling, as I'm squeezing these two metal mirrors, I'm forming actually eventually like a metal inside a metal mode, so my mode direction switches and I don't have any more um, confinement. That's why basically the cell drops very drastically as, at some point. The plasmonic part is interesting. Now look, I can actually go to like tens of nanometer small cavities and yet have a reasonably good per cell factor. But eventually I'm still losing as well. So we cannot go to extremely small. Although this is already like, like tens of nanometers, it's already reasonably small. If you normalize this interesting fact, this per cell factor by area, interesting plasmonics becomes, looks interesting. And then we look into devices. Basically we look into um, uh, how a uh, laser, modulator and detector performs. And we, we uh, benchmark them against basically the energy per bit and there's an electrical part and an optical part. The optical part is, let's say for example, in modular we have a something called power penalty. This is basically your, um, so the optical power penalty is basically like your, like your on off switch in your on state. Then it's basically the average uh, power that photo detector sees downstream. And then of course the eye closer penalty which is something related to the classical DC um, um, extinction ratio. So we need to take care of both, electrical and optical energy. The second one is speed. Again, electrically and optical. What's the optical speed? So this one, all, like we all know, what's, what's this one? This is basically the photon lifetime. If I have a high Q, my photon stays long time in my cavity and I cannot remodulate my signal. So of course I have this basically this averaging effect essentially. So what's the figure of merit? Well, it's basically my data capacity over the power times the cost. So what does it mean? It's basically, let's say for modulator, it would be my 3D bandwidth over energy per bit times the area for instance. So naturally, if I can make my device small, but I'm losing my effect. So there is a fundamental trade-off. But if I go small, I can make my capacitance small, which is great, and my energy goes down too. But again, this, the, the effect versus the performance is a fundamental trade-off. So I need to balance these two. Um, just two slides uh, for example here. So one is uh, like the laser. So this is the laser threshold. This is like the rate equation. You can solve this and you get this long beast here. And essentially there are like three terms that are highlighted here. And essentially we see at the end of the game, if I increase this per cell factor, actually I do win. This one actually hurts me. This cavity loss hurts me. My, 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 per cell, my, uh, my threshold increases. The gain absorption rate decreases, so my threshold actually decreases, this is good. And the pump efficiency, basically I'm getting more photons into the mode that I want. So it, this basically means my spontaneous emission beta factor is very high, which is again related to like, like raised to the cell factor. And long and behold, actually it's matches. See, for all cavities, the lowest threshold, so here minimum is good, is where I have the highest, the highest per cell factor. So the, percel, the threshold scales inversely proportional with, with per cell factor. And again, I can have a reasonably good per cell factor in plasmonic system, which are now orders of magnitude smaller than in my photonic system. That's sort of like the question. On the other hand, my, 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 my threshold is actually higher than um, in uh, plasmonic systems than in photonics. Can I tolerate this? The answer might be no. Something we should discuss probably. For electrolytic modulators, um, so I have light in, I basically switch it, I have my light coming out, so I have an electrical, like a field effect here, and a capacitance. So my energy, my electrical is one I have CV squared, so I take my C, I plug it in here, that's my, that, that's my capacitance. Here, um, voltage is E times H, I plug it in here, squared. Now one H cancels, and then I basically pull out all these geometries, and guess what, this is just simply my volume. Okay, that's interesting. And then basically here we have a relation for, um, for, the, for the electric field, which depends on uh, the bandwidth, and then this depends on Q. I can plug it in here. And essentially, if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at this, it's volume over Q. That's again one over per cell fact. But there's one more Q in there. So laser scales one over FP. Um, e the, the EOM scales one over FP times Q. So Q is more important. The detector actually, there's some interesting relationship still with the scaling, but Per cell factor, we're not 100% cleared. I think we should discuss this. <laughs> and um, then we also look at all optical switching devices, which depends also one over F, actually Q squared F here on a second order effect. 
And simply linearly, if you're in third order, so third order hit helps a little bit, actually. Um, Leuthold's group looked into uh, modulators and asked answers that if you want to have a very high switching, that means if you have this high, you can make the device small, the overlap factor needs to be very high, your material switch needs to be high, and you can have a slow light effect, meaning your interaction is basically enhanced. And he, sh he, he basically compared us, for instance, here for already a like, a, like, a, like a silicon slot, which is already confined, but then to a, to a metal one, which is even more confined. And essentially we see um, as he um, essentially um, goes from the, from the photonic to the, to the plasmonic one, his overlap factor increases, um, his slow light effect increases, and his overall switching is pretty, is pretty strong actually. So uh, now Kim asked me to um, basically talk a bit here about these new materials. So I, c I call it my active material, which is basically that gives me this basically my action. And here's an example for modulation. Of course, we have if I apply a voltage, change the effective index. We have a Pockels effect, Kerr, Franz Kelder, quantum confined version, electric carriers. And there's a whole bunch of the whole fleet of options you can choose from. You all know them. So there's carrier based ones, silicon, 3.5, graphene, transform conductive oxides, phase change, thermal effects. They have also some sort of pros and cons, but Kramer's chroniculation in physics fundamentally tells us that if you change your real part, you change your imaginary part. So you want to get some sort of phase change, you always take a hit and loss. And the question is, is there some sort of win-win that you can actually um, possibly achieve? And the answer is actually, it turns out a cavity can help, and the answer is yes. Um, this is ITO, so this is simply the Drudo model. Um, essentially, uh, what, what it means is this is like a real part. It, um, it shows as a function of carrier concentration, you can very drastically change this index. And, in, and here, basically, uh, here, like here's the real part, here's the imaginary part. You can really see, you can change it by unity, essentially. It's quite interesting. Um, you can also change the loss very dramatically. And this error here, incidentally, is a device we made in the past in this paper here. Um, you also notice if you get to this point here where this, where this tip ends, you actually have ENZ, epsilon near zero. So your wave is flat. And then you have a very strong interaction with your system. It's kind of an interesting point to, uh, to play around. ITO is an interesting material. Um, depending how you process it, you get all sorts of different uh, results. Um, this is literally all ITO, and you, look, you see physically it looks very different. Um, it has to do with like resistive well. Too much oxygen is, is gives you high resistance. Uh, too, too much tin gives you resistance. So there's some sort of resistive well structure. So we did an optometry, we characterized this, and we basically found you can actually get, um, get um, um, basically 0.15 actual K switching in your material and basic unity index switching in the, like in the uh, real part. That's, in, that's transference conductive oxide, so it, it good for switching. How about 2D materials? You heard about them. So graphene, semi-metal, yeah, some other materials which have, in, which have a wide variety of band gaps. They're also insulators. And um, they're also interesting materials um, for active photonics. This is, for instance, uh, graphene here. Graphene has something called like a polyblocking so essentially, if you look at the conductivity, the conductivity is something like the permittivity, like your, like your index, you can basically change that. Um, you get for a single sheet um, of graphene, you got um, basically about 2% of, um, of absorption um, and, um, in, the, in the near infrared. But it turns out um, uh, we can actually um, change this. I think my battery just died. Um, and we can actually um, tune this um, significantly as well, um, like, like over this range. Um, 2D materials are interesting, and this is sort of like the case um, here I, I, I want to bring today. The form, so if we want to go to like small, small um, uh, compact devices, uh, form factor actually helps, so it's very synergistic. Um, it has a decent okay mode overlap, we get a strong switching, um, it's electro-optical tunable, we can, con can, we can control the composition, and you can pattern it in your foundry. We can, we can, we can put it in CVD, and we can basically, chain, we can basically pattern it uh, to the areas that we like. And it's compatible with the substrate. So un unlike 3.5, essentially 2D materials are a quantum well you can put essentially anywhere. And you essentially preserve the quantum well um, behavior of this material. So they come in various flavors. Uh, it's like one metal and two calcogenides. So and it's like a buffet style. You can sort of pick and choose and then get various, various properties. Uh, if you look at this one here, um, they have a whole bunch of um, uh, band gaps that are available essentially. And you see theory and experiments still have to do a bit of um, work essentially. Um, what's interesting is if you have a bulk and you go to four of these layers, two or one, as you go to a mono layer, they become actually direct band gap. So um, they have a very nice um, properties. And as they become a direct band gap, basically we see their, photon, like their, their photoluminescence is increasing. And people have recently shown that you can have essentially 90, 90 plus percent internal quantum efficiency. So for lasing, that would be interesting and for photoconduction. 
um, these uh, we can tune them. For instance, from like molybdenum sulfide to selenide, basically we can we can alloy them and tune them. We can make junctions. This may be interesting for solar cell where you do spectral splitting and optimize each cell for your for your wavelength. And uh, this one slide about physics, essentially what's interesting is they have something called a high oscillator strength, which basically means you can again have a very strong electro-optic modulation. Um, here for instance, it's basically shown um, like a very, um, if you have one layer, it's basically all the way up here. If a multi-layer is basically all the way down here. So, and there's a like break here in this, uh, in this slide. So for, for modulation, the telecom band, you would essentially expect a very strong switching. And we are doing this right now. We're using these materials and interfacing them with si like silicon photonics or silicon plasmonics. Um, you need to watch the modal overlap factor. So if you simply use silicon, silicon has uh, in refractive, uh, like a plasma effect, um, you can tune your mode, um, but in order to get a decent switching, so up is good in this plot, you need to have a very strong uh, basic overlap factor, which means you need to make sure the entire mode basic is changed. Um, that uh, even if we, do, um, if we do this, we only get like medium amount of switching basically like, like on this level right here. Um, it turns out if we, for instance, use, um, use graphene or use this graphene effect or this ITO effect I told you before, essentially we can, we can actually get away with much lower overlap factors and get a significantly higher switching already. And these are some actual devices here. This is like a graphene device and this is like an optimized device we recently um, looked at. Uh, you can play, you can look at a whole bunch of modes. Um, so this is basically like, all, uh, like bulk modes. These are like slot modes and hybrid modes. And look, well, is silicon actually a good choice for an active material? Or maybe should I use these TCOs or maybe these graphene materials? And we mapped out all of them. Um, and here ho is how the mode look like. So you see some of them give you like very strong confinement. But what's really interesting is once you interface them with a the cavity, uh, something interesting happens. Um, so first of all, the question, so again, this is, this is as a function of cavity scaling length here. So um, the question is, do I win if I make my cavity uh, long? And if you have a bulk mode, a classical bulk mode, the answer is yes. So red color means it's good. So if, if you have a bulk mode, you make your cavity long all the way to the right here on each of these type of plots here, basically you win. We also see ITO and graphene get stronger switching than silicon, so the color is darker, that's, that's interesting. If we go to sort of like, uh, like nanoscale nano systems, what we actually see here is that 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 high spot is not, uh, not for very like, large cavities. It makes sense because the mode is fundamentally lossy. It has some metal in there. That means if you go, if you go too small, you, like you don't get any switching. If you go too long, you have too much loss. So naturally we are expecting some sort of optimum somewhere in between. And if you look actually where it is, it's not bad. It's around one micron. So it means I can make my device, my entire switching, let's say modulator, now a micron and I'm okay. Moreover, it turns out if you, if you work on this ENZ regime, you see there's this, there's, see this, this color dip slant to the left here? This point here, um, this is basically the carrier concentration for this ENZ regime. And that, that essential regime, um, if you follow the sort of like orange color here from here to this point, it slants over to the left, you essentially like we win by a factor of 10. Now we can make 100 nanometer long devices, which preserve the same functionality as we have typically in tens, tens of hundreds of uh, like devices. So this is an interesting direction we are, we are basically looking at. So let me give you just a few examples here. This is a module that we made in the past on this ITO. It's an, it's an MOS type structure where in this, it's like a MOS capacitor literally and we put in this, in this hotspot here, this is our optical mode. It's a hybrid plasma mode. In that hotspot basically we put our active material and then if we switch it basically we see this is a transfer curve here. This is like your like transistor IV curve essentially. This is your light versus, cur versus voltage. For a five micron long device, we get five dB of switching. For 20 micron long, we get 20 dB. This is one dB per micron. And if you leave out the ITO, nothing happens. So we know it's the, it's the actual effect. Um, this is the, how the device looks like. This is silicon photonics and in, in hybridized with this like metal plasmonics and ITO. And uh, again, the whole structure essentially is simple like three lambda long. That's, and that's all basically that, that it needs. Um, the performance, again, it's you can, we can scale it down. So I call it um, scalable speed and power. So this, uh, we can make the device now in the order of like a micron or less. The RC delay and also the internal switching time is, uh, is fast. We are still working on demonstrating this at this speed, but um, we are on a good, making good progress. And again, the power is on the uh, energy per bit. Graphene um, is interesting. You can buy, so this is the actual uh, refractive index now, and you can buy it as shown like here where essentially the real part changes dramatically, but the K doesn't change much. And this essentially would allow us to do like a like like phase change device. If I simply bias it over and shift it to here, to this regime, my real part doesn't change much, but, but, but my K changes and I can basically make, an, make a linear uh, like electro-absorption type of device. 
Um, with this, we actually demonstrated the first um, plasmon um, electroabsorption modulator recently. This is how the device looks like. Again, we use this like this, uh, this, this, this confined mode. And if you look at the switching basically here, so this is like your optical response as a function of voltage. You see it's just, it's less than one volt. So it's basically, basically 0.7 volt. And the reason why this works so well, unlike some previous works which, uh, like which used four, five, six volts to switch, like to switch, is we have a very good electrostatics. And this is basically enabled because in this device we can have this metal, which is our plasmonic mode, so it's basically a plasmonic mode confiner. It is an electrical contract for free. And this means we have fundamentally a very low res like resistivity. And resistivity basically comes in, in this equation here in this, in this A0, which is basically like a resistive term and, and into, this like, like into, um, into this voltage term. Which means, if you think about it, any photonic crystal cavity as you have, for instance, or any photonic structure, you bring a metal close to tune it, to modulate it, to do something electrically with it, you hurt the mode, you destroy the mode. Which means that's a fundamental problem, for instance, like in photonic crystals, you cannot really tune them well. With these plasmonic hybrid systems, you get this contact for free. And this means now your electrostatics is strong, your resistance is low, which means your overall performance is high, and this allowed us to, be, to basically have the first sub-volt sub um, basically switch. Also, you have, of course, heat dissipation. All right, so here's a performance chart to kind of sum it all up. Um, in, um, uh, in ring resonators right now, we have a, you know, a figure of merit is the speed over the you know, energy power penalty times the area in gigabits per femtojoule per micrometer of that value. If you go to uh, simply uh, change the active material for in, silic in SOI to graphene, still SOI, for photonic mode, we already win by three orders of magnitude. We can go to plasmonic structures. Uh, we can we go to 10 to minus two, so it would be significantly better already in order of magnitude. Or if we hybridize it now in this fashion, as we've shown here, we again um, win um, like basically on the footprint, and we can again like probably from here to here win another by maybe two, possibly three orders of magnitude in terms of scaling. Um, what can we do with this? Um, so photonics, we know it's great, diffraction, but it's, it's, it's diffraction limited, so it's somewhat large possibly, so the footprints of devices are large because the interaction is low, the Lightman interaction is low, the energy is possibly on the higher side, but they propagate long, which is, which is nice, which I can, so I can use them on a chip. Uh, plasmonics, on the other hand, is uh, not limited by any of these. It's uh, more efficient possibly, but of course it doesn't propagate long. So the question is, can we simply test, take the best of both worlds and hybridize? the two and get good switching, good scaling, and high bit flow densities, et cetera. And um, we published this in this recent paper where we've asked fundamentally, if I have a link now, can I, uh, can I make a, like a plasmonic hybrid link? And how does this compare to electronics or photonics or pure plasmonics? And here's basically the, the, like the result. So if you have electronics, uh, you're limited by your capacitance fundamentally. Um, in uh, plasmonics, you need to repeaters every 100 micrometer, that's basically unfeasible. Pure photonics is decent, actually that's our silicon photonics. And if you hybridize this, hybridizing means the active device, the, the, the source, the modulator and the detector is, a, is, a, is basically a plasmonic device and it's interfaced with silicon photonics. We end up in this regime right down here. And the third axis basically is our bit flow density. So the, how many bits per, uh, per area. So this brings me to a power roadmap. Um, so you probably wanna all go know where are we going with this? And this is basically where we see the big picture. So right now, this is classical, this is what I call in my silicon photonics. So right now we use hundreds of femtojoule, maybe down to 10, in fact, a few femtojoule, we heard the talk earlier. So we're really pushing this down to this, to this like one femtojoule limit. But we pretty much, you know, if I tape out something in the foundry, I'm pretty much sitting basically up here. That means fundamentally, you know, 100 femtojoule means I'm using 10 to the five photons per bit. So that's when I talk to Mari, or I used to talk to Mari Panicia, and he asked me, do you have a laser? And then he asked me how much power do you have? And I said, well, you know, nanowatt, he was not interested. He wanted milliwatt. Well, that's, that's basically why. Because if I multiply now the energy efficiency times the bandwidth, essentially, so that's basically joule per bit times bit per second. That's joule per second. That's what? That's the third axis is simply power burned. And uh, yeah, that means right now on a single device level, we use milliwatt. The question is, can we bring this down to maybe micromod? And the answer is probably yes. Um, if we go to this like nanoscale regime, um, which means you see these, these, these ISO power lines here, um, uh, this error is steeper than the ISO power lines. And again, bandwidth is the other factor. If I have this uh, large device, which I, I need a long interaction length, I need millimeter or maybe hundreds of micrometer long interaction lengths. That means my RC delay is high. That means my bandwidth is fundamentally high as well. So if they, the idea is if we go to this like nanoscale regime, essentially I can go to like micro scale devices and my bandwidth maybe approaches 100, 100 gigabits per second or maybe even beyond. 
Of course, you see quantum down here. I think we're not there yet, probably, because then we like we run into S and R issues and and a bit error rate, rate issues and so on. But this is basically like our 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 uh, direction. There is nothing is free, right, in life. So there is a Q over V. This 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 is basically like the amount of Purcell factor you need to introduce into your system to make this happen. And but these values are reachable right now experimentally. So. That's basically like the big picture here. So now we have links. Now you can go to compute systems, um, energy efficiency on the y-axis, and x-axis basically is so, sort of like your speed, well, normalized per area uh, and, per, and per second. So uh, in electronics, we know electronics is great, but electronics is fundamentally limited um, in terms of speed, um, but also in terms of like actual like power dissipation, which is heating up these wires, their ohmic resistance, that's basically lossy. If we go to something that's like sort of photonics, essentially like we use the bosonic character of photons or of, of, of RF waves in a way, um, you have more parallelism built in because photons like bosons don't interact strong with each other. So that's basically good. So we can basically uh, like increase the speed, but they don't scale well. So the question is actually, can we go beyond this? And this is basically an, 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 an direction where we're trying to say, we're trying to map directly the, the computation that we want to get done. We don't want to do like ons and offs anymore. We want to directly have some sort of computation done and I, and I map my algorithm to my hardware directly one to one. That means I sort of use the hardware itself to basically do my, do my like, like not give me zeros and ones, but give me directly maybe in differentiation or give me integration or give me an FFT directly, you know, system like, like by propagating through my structure. And photonics is basically very good at this. So we are basically working on this one, this, this, this theme. And here's one example I brought to you um, before I wrap up. Um, this is a, um, uh, uh, an, an optical arithmetic um, compute engine. Uh, the way it works, basically, we recently designed this. This is like in, basically like, in, like a two by two uh, switch, um, and it's a, photo it's a hybrid photon silicon photonic plasmonic version. It's just like five micron long, and it uses uh, like less than one femtojoule per bit. And we have a patent on this, um, with Richard, um, and we basically now package this into an optical router. And this optical router now is basically doing um, optical arithmetic. So it's basically like a modular scheme. So imagine you, like you want to um, have the number 17, and, and you have a basis of four. So you do like 17 divided by four, it's four, it's 16, four, rest one. So what you do, you have four waveguides coming from top, four, four from the bottom. What you simply do, you basically route three of them, one over, and this one uh, that, that was on the left all the way over here. So, th so that would be like basically like, um, like residue one or modulus one. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a multipurpose compute engine. And the way why I think this is interesting again, because a photon, we all like photons. Photon has, has momentum. And momentum, the mass times velocity. So if you um, uh, you can never essentially slow or stop a photon. If the velocity would go to zero, the mass would go to infinity. That means fundamentally, a photon must always flow. It can never stop un like unless you kill it, unless you annihilate it, right? You detect it. So a photon must always flow. Can we, while we flow the photon, get computation done? And the answer is yes. Um, with this with this algorithm, basically, we can. And it's, it's a, you can think about it as an, it's an in the network compute engine. And if you look at the numbers down here, probably too small. Actually, it's very competitive. To, in fact, it's uh, quite three orders of magnitude better than basically uh, current NOC with 22 nanometer technology now. So this feeds this, this one. And then uh, my last slide here, this is a slide I made <laughs> about one and a half years ago when I was excited about AIM. So one of these devices is um, a photonic device. The other one is an electronic device. Would you know which one is which? Any guesses? <laughs> well, that's the whole point. <laughs> um, the question is, so it turns out the left one is actually a transistor, is in FinFET, and the right one actually is uh, from Miller's group from Stanford, is actually a uh, plasmonic enhanced um, antenna uh, device. The point is, in, uh, CMOS is really, so the question is, are we, being are, we, are we as photonics people driven by CMOS, or are we driving now CMOS? I think the chicken and egg thing is maybe possibly switching now, right now. So I think this is something that got me excited at the time. And um, what's great about this is, yeah, we can, we can design these 100 nanometers uh, small metallic structures like routinely in, in CMOS. So, and again, with these devices, we will probably harness this right now. So I think this is an interesting discussion we might have over lunch. So these are just some conclusions here. On, uh, let me just point out this one essentially again. The, the main point is, I believe, due to Kramer's chronic relations and due to the, like, these strong switching effects in these new materials, we tr actually have a true opportunity right now to address the optical constraints and the electrical constraints simultaneously. Um, and we can discuss maybe what that might mean. So these are all my collaborators. Thank you very much.
time to talk, uh, so perhaps somebody has a quick question before uh, we leave for lunch. If not, I reckon Kim does. Quick question. Uh, so uh, a question about two aspects of what you said. One is, do we have a scaling vector for photonics? Uh, for photonic shrink. Uh, and then secondly, uh, you mentioned we can get contacts for free with, with the hybrid structure. Can we use those in, to eliminate the contact loss in, in the more his classical photonics? Right. Um, the, the contact loss, I believe, we can use them at least electrostatically. Um, I, we, um, I have not investigated personally whether we can use them to maybe actively inject carriers. Like, in, uh, it's something we looked at with IBM. So we, we, we actually published a paper on this. And it's, it suggested that it might work, but it was just simulation at this time. It was not, we didn't demonstrate the actual device. So I think for electrostatically, I definitely give it a yes. I know it works. We, we made some devices. But for injecting, um, that's maybe still yet, like, like yet to be seen. Um, do we have a scaling vector for photonics? I believe we do. Um, at least uh, since we did this, this, this sort of scaling analysis now, in fact, it was really like Thomas said in the audience, it was really like motivated by Thomas Brock from your uh, 2011 uh, paper, from your conference paper, where he, like, he looked into some sort of scaling for um, um, uh, basically for modulators. So we said, you know, this is interesting. Can we, can we look beyond this? And it's, uh, it sounds actually that we have some uh, scaling uh, vector um, at least I would say down to maybe the hundreds of nanometers right now. So I think an order of magnitude looks, looks promising. Then things become really probably, we need to then discuss for the bit error rates and those kind of questions. Thank you. So let's thank all of our speakers again, please.